In our final discussion for the semester, we're going to look at the process of senescence. Now, senescence simply means getting old and dying. And all organisms, to some extent, seem to have some element of this. But there are certain organisms that are able to reset and uh, get rid of some of the impact of, of aging. And basically, as organisms get older, most organisms get less good at replacing their cells, at repairing their cells, at taking cells that are damaged or diseased and getting rid of them. And so that causes, inevitably, um, in these organisms, death. Now, there are some organisms that seem to have gotten around that. But as we look at this, it's somewhat helpful to think about it as a disease process. Um, it's a process that has a physiological impact on the organism. It's detrimental to our, our health and our overall fitness is often impacted. But it's important to remember that there are many evolutionary um, considerations that we need to look at when we're evaluating what the natural selection impact of senescence will be. First off, there are many mutations, many adaptations that have been a trade-off. And one of the trade-offs that has occurred is a trade-off for speed meaning that if you can grow fast or get to a mature age where you can reproduce and do that quicker than other organisms, that might be a benefit. And so if the trade-off is that you're going to wear yourself out, you're going to die a little bit earlier, but you get able to reproduce in the right environment, that is often a net benefit. It's a, it's a trade-off that works. So we see this in fruit flies especially, but you can also see it in mammals and birds where many organisms especially those that have very, very um, high metabolisms, also will have very short lives. So they're living fast like a, a shrew, and, and body size is correlated here, like a mouse or a shrew. They have very short lives, but they also reproduce quickly. They get to a, a reproductive age very, very quickly. So they have adapted for and have alleles and mutations that allow them to, to do everything quickly, and that's an advantage in that niche. Also, it's important to remember that if reproduction is front-loaded into a life cycle, meaning that you reproduce mainly when you're young, and there's very, very little reproduction when you're old, then there's going to be almost no natural selection force on diseases of old age, things that, that, that cause problems. So, for instance, Alzheimer's disease in humans has a fairly strong genetic component. And the reason that there hasn't been stronger selection to remove those alleles that cause Alzheimer's disease is it does not have much of an impact on the overall fitness of an individual. Because individuals begin to develop symptoms of Alzheimer's disease most of the time well after they are done reproducing. So they've already passed on their genes, they've already had children, those genes are in their population. There's no strong force removing, I say genes, sorry, I meant alleles. There's no strong force removing those alleles from the population. So there's no selection, or at least very weak selection, on post-reproductive mutations that only really have an impact in post-reproductive years. And then finally, one other trade-off that causes aging is a trade-off for reproduction. And what I mean by reproduction is usually we're talking about numbers. Whereas if you can have more offspring, but again, it wears your body out, the trade-off for that mutation of having more eggs is that you're going to age faster. In many instances, that's a very good trade. And this is especially common in organisms that use a K strategy. K strategy refers to a concept on what is the most successful way to reproduce. And there are basically two strategies. You might have already had these in ecology or even learned about them in introductory biology. But the K strategy is that you invest as few resources as possible in each offspring and you just make a ton of them. So many insects, spiders, uh, sea turtles as far as vertebrates go, they are case strategists where they have the bare minimum to have a embryo develop, it hatches, and then it's on its own. And you might have 200, 300, 1,000 babies, and only a handful of them may survive to adulthood. That's a case strategy. Our strategy is where you put all of your resources into just a very few offspring. Most mammals are more our strategists, and humans really are kind of the ultimate our strategists, where it takes, you know, 18 years or maybe more before an individual is ready to survive on their own. Okay, now, case strategists, there's often strong selection for more and more and more offspring. 
And so if there's a way to eke out more offspring, it may be a benefit and will often be kept, even if it shortens the life of that organism. So senescence might be a trade-off for having lots of babies in, in, in many cases. Now, this is a reminder of this idea of antagonistic pleiotropy, that an allele that has multiple jobs, when it mutates, it might make a benefit in one of those jobs, say, number of babies you're gonna have, but it's detrimental in another one, say, repair of telomeres or something like that. And so if that allele overall is a net benefit, it will still be selected for despite that trade-off. And that is termed antagonistic pleiotropy. So as we start thinking about senescence and aging and the evolutionary impact of this, many people are interested in looking at what is the oldest living organism. Now, really, this is a bad question. It's not a valid question. And the reason is, as I've said, organism, it implies all living uh, creatures, all organisms, right? So whether you're a bacteria or a fungus or a plant or an animal or a protozoan or, or whatever you are, right? What is the oldest living organism? Now, I would submit to you that the oldest living organism is a bacteria. And you're like, wait a second, bacteria don't live very long. They reproduce every 20 minutes, right? And they, or, or sometimes a little more, but ideally, ideal conditions every 20 minutes. That's not an old organism, but think about it. Every single bacteria on Earth can trace its history all the way back to the very first living cell on Earth. And there's no life cycle in bacteria where you get old, you have babies, you maybe survive and you die. All you do is split in half. And each of those new cells is composed equally of the original cell. So it's not like giving birth and then dying. You just split in half and, and half of you is in one cell and half of you is in the other. So you didn't die, you just made two of you. So really every bacteria that is still alive today can be traced back in an unbroken path. So really, it's silly if you don't have a multicellular organism and a, a clear life cycle where you're having offspring that are distinct from yourself. It's silly to ask this question, but we could certainly ask it for other groups where it does make sense. So turtles are uh, notorious, uh, famous, right, for their, their long age. They can live to 150, 200 years. There are sharks and whales that can live about that long too. So among vertebrates, that's about 150 to 200 years is the upper extreme, and most vertebrates are much, much less than that. But even this, if we're considering it, maybe among a small group like vertebrates, it makes sense to ask this question. But realize that if I expand it, that there are some organisms that essentially are immortal, at least as we, far as we tell, they have the potential to live forever, never die, they don't need to make babies. They can just kind of reproduce clonally or asexually, and they can make as many and, uh, uh, copies of themselves and extend that. So seagrass is a good example. Many seagrasses are probably tens of thousands of years old, and we really don't know because they keep refreshing their cells and uh, rebuilding themselves, but they're just springing up from the roots. It's all the same organism all um, together. And there are even some animals. Uh, like the immortal jellyfish, you can look it up if you want, but the immortal jellyfish goes through two different distinct life cycles and can just go back and forth, back and forth, seemingly without end, and doesn't seem to suffer from these uh, buildups of mutations that are senescent. So it has been selected to minimize that. So really, it is possible to live forever, and there are people that are working on ways to extend human lifespan. But there have been so many mutations and so many of these things we've talked about that you know, as long as you've reproduced, it doesn't matter if it's a trade-off for speed or if it's a trade-off for uh, giving your offspring a better chance and, and at your own risk. Those might be very, very good things. There's so many things that are built up in the human population that really we're probably not gonna be able to extend human life much at all. In fact, all of our advances over the last 200 years of modern medicine really have not extended the maximum lifespan, right? It's about 110 to, in extreme cases, 120 years. And there were people, there were many fewer of them in the past, but there were people that lived that long. There are many more centenarians, right? People that lived to 100 today than there were 100 years ago. But it's still about the same maximum uh, lifespan, okay? So really, we could ask this question on a limited basis, but in reality, it's kind of a silly question. And there are some organisms that seem, at least it's feasible, to be able to live forever.